Sorry, say again. Oh. It's time for Arrested DevOps and the Food Fight Show, the podcast where we help you achieve understanding, develop good practices, and operate your team and organization for maximum DevOps awesomeness. I'm Matt Stratton, and joining me today is... I'm Nell Shamrell Harrington, and Food Fight Show is about chef, DevOps, and everything in between. We are delighted to be joining forces with Arrested DevOps today. Before we get into our very first dial-in, so to speak, show a word from our sponsors. Do, 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 sponsor pre-roll here. Great. So uh, this is a first. It's not our first joint episode with Food Fight Show. I, I feel like we've done them before. But this is definitely the first time we've actually sat down and said, let's do an episode together rather than just sort of randomly doing one at a conference. And it's also our very first dial-in show. Now, I will try to, I should have done my homework better to tell the story of how the show came about. But I know we'll, the story. Okay, so I want to hear, Nicole, we'll put the links to the tweets in the show notes if I can find them. But that's, as all good things, this did start on Twitter as a joke. See also Pete Chesbot. <laughs> So, Nicole, what's your recollection of the genesis of this, this episode? I'm pretty sure. So, someone posted a link, and it may have been Preet. I think it was J. Paul Reed who posted a link to some ridiculous, like another study, another study of someone finding again. Let me say again. Did I say again? That open office spaces are awful, right? Or someone, right? And I'm like, okay, again. So many companies ask me if they should do an open office space and if I have data on it and if I'd be willing to do a research project on it for them and if I'll take their money to do another research project on this for them. So no, open office spaces are not good for this. Would you do research? And so I like I made some snarky tweet where it was like office space open office spaces are bad. You sure Nicole? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and it was like, Google it. Wait, do, would you do research on it? And finally, I'm like, no, just Google the thing. You sure, Nicole? Yes. And it started this like yeah. long, crazy thing where we were like. Well, Paul said should... there should be a podcast called Yes, Sure, Nicole. <laughs> yes. And Nicole was like, I don't have time for a podcast. And I was like, well, this sure sounds like an episode of Food Fight or ADO. And there you go. And, and when we announced it uh, repeatedly the other day, there was a very excited tweet from Paul Reed saying basically the, Oh my God, it's happening. <laughs> so, yes. so then the unofficial someone, title of someone this episode. Even made, someone even made a, a picture of like, Oh, a logo. Yeah. A logo of, you gotta, sure Nicole? you gotta find it for the cover oh. art for this episode. So yeah, the I unofficial I title have it. This, I saved it. Oh, good. Make sure I get it. The unofficial title of this episode is yes, sure. Nicole. <laughs> so that being said, what we've done, is we posited or questioned or raised the ability for people to ask their questions of Nicole and we're putting them out. Uh, we'll be accepting questions in three different slacks because E too and many I've got slacks. The Twitter up. And we I'm have, checking we have the Twitter. So you can tweet at Nicole at a Nicole FV or at Arrested DevOps or, or at Food Fight Show. Um, but yeah, if you jump on, if you're a member of the Chef Community Slack, uh, post them in the Chef channel. If you go into Hangouts, I don't know, ask them there somewhere. Somehow Nell will find them. Uh, it's in the Chef channel. In the Chef channel. And then in DevOps chat, there's an Arrested DevOps channel. So post them in somewhere in there. Um, we'll ask your questions. We'll ask our questions because even yeah. though Nell and I have had the ability to be uh, colleagues and uh, pals with Nicole, we still always have lots of questions uh, to ask. So, so can I start with start the open? Can I start with yeah. the open office spaces one? Someone Jump asked in. me this. Someone asked me last week. So let's just go ahead and get this started. Okay. So uh, so many we companies do, we should introduce ourselves. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Yeah. I get so excited. That's okay. That that's good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So doing the introductions, I'm Nell Shamrail Harrington, co-host of Food Fight. Delighted to be there. And Matt, who are you? Uh, so I'm Matt Stratton. I am the co-host of Arrested DevOps. Um, I'm also delighted to be here, and I work at Chef, and I'm based in Chicago. I'm Nicole, uh, Nicole Fortran. I'm a guest on Food Fight and Arrested DevOps. Um, I'm CEO and Chief Scientist at Dora DevOps Research and Assessment, and uh, I do I rub science on things. I do and a I bunch of research. 
And I've got to do it because I hardly ever get to call you this, but we have Dr. Forsgren with us today. Thank you. All right, let's go on into the questions. Uh, you to okay. Uh, so do you want me to start with the, with yeah, the open jump office spaces? Let's jump in. Okay, Nicole, open offices. Do you have fields? Mm -hmm. Open offices. I mean, I don't know if I have fields, but I've read a whole, but I don't have the data. I've read a whole bunch of people that have a whole bunch of studies that have a whole bunch of data on all the things. So, so here's the thing. Everybody wants to do open office spaces or they, they think they want to do open office spaces for several reasons. One, like it's the hot, cool new thing, right? So many people are doing it in Silicon Valley. So many companies want to do it. They think it's like super exciting. Okay, here's why. It might be interesting and it might be really encouraging for open collaboration, open communication, um, free flow of ideas. Also, saves you money, right? Because it, it stays on real estate space. You don't have to put up a whole bunch of walls. Uh, many times it's also good for uh, natural light. So we do know that natural light is actually uh, contributes to better productivity, better uh, happiness. Uh, lots of really, really good things in terms of work and so many things. The challenge though is that it tends to have negative effects in terms of uh, productivity. It tends to decrease your ability to get work done, concentrate. It, it increases um, shifting uh, or uh, juggling tasks. And so you have drastic, drastic decreases in how much you can get things done. So you have to end up increasing how many like pods you have, uh, phone call in booths, uh, meeting rooms, um, distractions. So you have to have like more headphones, like noise canceling headphones, but even like people that walk past your desks. And then in terms of that cost savings that you have, so many times companies are like are super excited because they have cost savings, right? So they'll do things like open office spaces because they save costs, but they don't do all the other things that all the other super fun Bay Area companies do. Like they don't do dry cleaning, they don't do um, childcare, they don't do food, they don't do everything else that helps offset everything else. So. Uh, by and large part, open office spaces are not super conducive to getting a whole lot of things done. If you have open office spaces, you have to have a lot of other things to offset the productivity costs. Now, it is good to have um, co-located workspaces, but, but you have to have a lot of other things to kind of offset the productivity hits. Awesome. And we just got a follow-on question in Hangops from Michael T. Lombardi. The question is, do we find that open office spaces contribute more to leaky tribal knowledge transfers, that's uh, in red, uh, versus tools like Slack, slash HipChat, slash wherever, where people will share knowledge verbally and lose the recording of that knowledge for people who weren't on, in on the conversation? Uh, so leaky tribal knowledge transfers. Um, so what do you mean? So leaky tribal knowledge transfers, let me, let me find that. Can you, can you say the leaky tribal knowledge transfers one more time? I, uh, I'm guessing, sorry, didn't want to cut you off now. I, my no, translation sure. on the verses would seem like a leaky tribal knowledge, like oh, okay. I'm just talking to you with mouth words very quickly right. to help you solve your problem. And that information transfer is not captured in any kind of a way. It's right. not shared. So it just sort of leaked from me to you right. and boom. So not necessarily because you can still have one-on-one uh, -on -one slacks and one-on-one -on -one chats where um, like you don't necessarily, so like I, I could Slack or I could chat Nell or I could Slack or I could chat Matt and then it, it doesn't go to anybody else. Uh, we can still Zoom, we can still Google Hangout, we can still Google Chat. Um, it, it can contribute to, and it's, and it's not even necessarily open office spaces, it's co-located office spaces, right? So you can still have uh, flybys, you can still have um, the water cooler conversations that can contribute to more and better collaboration. So, so many people got really upset with Marissa Meyer when she said everyone has to be on site. And some people, you know, really don't appreciate the Netflix model where you have to be on site. But quite honestly, there are, there are a lot of things that happen better when you're co-located. It's just true. It just happens and it's just better. Um, 
for certain types of collaboration and spontaneous um, communication and knowledge transfer. So like one piece of my research um, is in knowledge transfer and knowledge management and communication and collaboration. There are some things that just work better when you're co-located, that the spontaneous communication that happens is just better when you're, when you're there. Um, however, we do know that that does have um, incidental negative effects on diversity because it ends up, um, what's a good way to say this? It ends up disproportionately affecting those who tend to be, um, who tend to have non-traditional families or family structures or work environments or come from non-traditional backgrounds or disadvantaged backgrounds. So single parent families, single moms uh, who work farther away from the workforce, right? So um, like if you don't have a parent at home or, or a partner at home who can take care of the family, it's much more difficult for you to, to transit into work. And so having a, a remote workforce makes it a lot easier to remote in which means you can contribute to the diversity of thought and diversity of um, contribution to building software and communi communities and everything else better. Awesome. We got one clarification from Michael in chat, which was, does the physical visual availability of humans nearby make you more likely to fall back on face-to-face -face methodology? Um, it, it helps, yes. Or it can help, but not necessarily. I mean, there have been several times, so anecdotally, I know this isn't the same thing as data, but anecdotally, sometimes I just get lazy and, and I still text and I still type. And that can be nice because it, you, you end up having that recording. But there are, um, like I have friends that do uh, research in this area and and we, we see channel effects where some people uh, prefer to, to communicate verbally and they prefer or they prefer you know other things to be in chat medium and they prefer other things to be in email um, and they prefer other things to be in video chat even if you're co-located um, but by being remote you have forcibly removed a certain type of communication medium Cool. All right. We've got another question and that is from Glenn Sarti in Hangops which is metrics Hi, Glenn. Yep. Metrics are great, but we see them weaponized a lot, either by gaming them as engineers or measuring the wrong things as managers. Do you have any advice on how to use metrics responsibly? E.g., I heard you mention use competing metrics, MTTF versus MTTR. So, Nicole, how do we use metrics responsibly? Uh, so there's this great quote by... Uh, uh, the gentleman that wrote the goal, why am I forgetting his name right now? Um, but he wrote, and, and it's because I'm, I, I'm getting the wrong name coming to mind right now. It uh, still starts Bloom? with a G. Yeah, Goldblum. Uh, or not Goldblum. Uh, not okay. Goldblum. I'm getting Gladwell, and I know that's also wrong. The goal, this is why I have... I'm, I'm doing the Google. And I've even got it like... Gold Sorry, rat. I was in on mute. It's there gold rat. Go. It's gold rat. And he said, no. And he said, um, tell me how you measure me and I'll tell you how I behave. Right? And so, yes, there's this, there's this fantastic um, idea of capture metrics that are in tension with each other. Right? And that will really, really help. Because that will help keep things, keep metrics from being gamed. So... The challenge here, you're right, is that, is that we don't want metrics to kind of be a bludgeon. And hopefully management will understand and the entire organization and the culture will, under, will understand that the goal, the goal, pun not intended, but really. The lowercase goal. <laughs> the lowercase goal is that um, what we want is continu continuous improvement, right? We don't want KPIs. We don't want local optimizations. The goal is continuous improvement and the end goal, the capital G goal, um, delivering value, customer satisfaction, um, making money and continued value delivery. And so when we, when we use metrics in that way for values alignment, that can be a really, really fantastic thing. 
right? And so what we what we tend to focus in on uh, for my research and what we've seen works very, very well for organizations um, as an example um, is both for software uh, development delivery is both speed and stability because those are attention. It speaks to both development and operations, their intention. Um, and it helps us focus on, and it seems like it's it's kind of a short-term goal, but it's a short-term goal that serves to allow you to pivot when you need to pivot, deal with compliance and regulatory changes. We know that it is predictive of value creation in terms of profitability, productivity, and market share, delighting your customers, those types I, of things. I mean, I think transparency around these goals is, is huge, right? Because Absolutely. mandates never work, right? And and people will will work again, obviously, you know, will will work to the the incentive you give them even at the destruction of your company. Um, there's there's two anecdotes that come to mind. One is uh, I've I've heard Jez tell the anecdotal story of you know a company where they said we're gonna add a test in every sprint. And in every sprint there was a test added that was assert equals true. And they're like, sure did add a test, did what you said did the thing you said to do, and we will do the minimum thing you ask us to do, because that's how we know we get our cookie, we get our pat in the head, we've done the thing that you've told us is how we measure our value as a contributor, right? So if I'm told the way that I measure my value as a contributor is by adding tests, not by shipping better software, and I know that's a super vague, you know, we, we wanna make it better, but those are two different things, right? And the other that's just, uh, I'm not going to, I, I hesitate to, to use this example because as a person, he's awful, but in a very, very old book by Scott Adams, he, he you know, told the story of a company where they had, uh, they had a system of bug bounty where QA testers received a $50 bonus for every bug they found and software engineers received a $50 bonus for every bug that they fixed. And overnight, a black market came up in software engineers introducing defects, telling their friends in test where the defects were so they could find them. And then, of course, the engineer knows how to fix it. And they pay out thousands of dollars in these bug bounties in 48 hours. And the yeah. thing is, none of this is driven around what they're actually trying to do. And Right. Uh, right. So what is the goal? The goal is to deliver quality software to make our customers happy and deliver value. Right. Always go for the end goal and the outcome. Outcomes are like the, the the most important word. This is my new joke. Like, so in 2014, you couldn't give a talk. You were not allowed, I think. The rule was you couldn't give a talk at DevOps days without using the word empathy. I'm pretty sure this year you can't talk about DevOps without using the word outcome. That's our word of the year. I know. Everybody needs, and, and I don't mean that as like to make fun of doing it. I mean that like every now and again, we find this thing where we're like, we have to spend a year pounding this into everybody's skull so you get it. And I think that's this year is outcomes. Learn nothing else but outcomes this year, and then you can learn something new next year. A new book, Empathetic uh, Outcomes, coming out next year. <laughs> oh, talk idea. SEO, SEO for the win, right? Okay. It'll be all outcomes. All right, we've got a question from Rob Kidd in the Food Fight channel of Chef Community Slack, and it's howdy. Here's a question I'm still pondering. What are some specific DevOpsy practices an organization can adopt that also have a clear, measurable return on investment? And how do I do that measurement? So what I'm thinking is, you as an engineer, you come to an exec, exec says, all right, we can do this, but let me know what the ROI is. Uh, ah, how, how do we do that? Good times. I'm going to go back to your favorite buzzword, Matt. Right? So when we're talking about ROI, we want to be talking about outcomes. Right, we always want to be talking about some kind of outcomes. Um, I've got a great ROI white paper, by the way. It's posted on DevOps-Research.com. Um, it's free. Everyone can go check it out. So, if you want to talk about the practices that can drive value that you can help, like tie back to some ROI, I can kind of deconstruct this in a couple different ways. So, uh, let me let me start with the practices. So, the things that we know drive good outcomes. We've been researching this for the last few years. So I work with um, Jez Humble, I work with Gene Kim, we work uh, with the group at Puppet, and we've been studying this for several years. Some good practices fall into a few key categories. And we know that they drive good outcomes. When I say drive, I'm talking more about more than just correlation, I'm talking about predicts. So the categories are culture, technology, automation, um, 
process, like management processes, agile processes, and also measurement and monitoring. Um, these are outlined in the last few state of DevOps reports, and also the 2017 state of DevOps report will be released the first week of June. So you could download all these, all these reports, they're free. There's also a link to all of these um, on the DevOps, the, the Dora website as well, devopsdeskresearch.com. So in terms of culture, we know that a good um, organizational culture that fosters information flow is good. Um, and, and some of these questions have been open sourced as well. In terms of technology practices, we know things like using version control, like version control all the things, all of your production artifacts is good. Improving your test automation, improving your deployment automation, these are all good things. Developing off of trunk, having good trunk-based development practices is good. Uh, doing continuous integration, doing, doing uh, continuous development is good. Um, having a good handle on uh, test data management, shifting left on security, these are all good. In terms of agile practices, uh, using WIP limits, using visualization, um, working in small batches, these are all good examples in terms of measurement and monitoring, using uh, monitoring tools, uh, and using data to help drive business decisions, right? So don't just use like monitoring to wake you up in the middle of the night. That's not enough. Um, notification of failures uh, from closer rather than far. So um, having having automated notification and not just from like Twitter and your customers in the knock. Um, uh, using like value stream maps, these types of things are all helpful uh, and good practices that we've seen drive your ability to develop and deliver software with both speed and stability. The other nice thing about all of these is that it's nice because it delivers value, but it also decreases your deployment pain and it decreases burnout, which in terms of people who are doing the work is fantastic, right? Because we want to make our work better. The thing that's nice in terms of an organizational standpoint is that it also has been shown to um, help employee hiring and retention. So we see that high performing teams are 2.2 times more likely, or employees in high performing teams are 2.2 times more likely to recommend their organization as a good place to work, which is huge because hiring is such a big thing right now. Right, that it's such a big expense, it's such a big cost. Turnover is so expensive. Um, these findings have been replicated in places like Harvard, right? So HBR found that um, employee net promoter score was a huge predictor of revenue in organizations as well. So when we, like, if we shift over, if we take a slight shift over to actual ROI calculations, what we want to do is think about this in terms of both, both cost savings and value. And I really suggest that, that companies really think about this in terms of value and not just cost savings. Cost savings is good, but it's it's really, it has limited applicability. We're really used to thinking about this in terms of cost, but that has a short and small shelf life because once we've reduced our cost, we're done reducing our cost, right? We can cut our costs, but once we've cut that cost, we're done. And we is cut our cost cutting not an outcome, but it's a thing that gets you to the outcome anyway, right? Like you're not in business <laughs> to spend less money. Right. And, I mean, and this maybe the government is. I don't know. Maybe this does get a little different in yeah, public sector, but right. most oh. businesses are not in business to spend less. They're in business to make more. To make value and deliver value to customers. And I love that point. So, and government's nice. And by the way, stay tuned. 2017 State of DevOps report. Yay! We deliver value. DevOps helped us deliver value to all organizations, not just those that are profit driven and commercially based. Saving money is good and it's important. And that's what helps us continue to deliver to value, right? Like we don't just wanna be burning money all the time, but saving money, we can only save money so far. And once I've saved money, that has diminishing returns. Let's say I save money this year. Once I've saved a million dollars this year, I can no longer save that same million dollars next year. I don't keep getting credit for it. Sorry, like that's not the way business works. That makes sense. I said a million dollars. I'm done. Also, like that's a little scary for those of us who are in technology because does that turn into cost cuts? The better way to think about it is saving resources, saving time through automation. Let technology do the boring, rote, mundane, repetitive work. Recover those cycles, turn that into 
innovative, value-driven work. Let us solve problems. Let us do interesting, innovative things that computers weren't meant to do. And let us take that time and drive value and innovation for the company. Because you know what? That's essentially new free headcount, right? If you, can, if you can save a third of my day, I'm a third of a new person. A third of Matt, a third of Net, Nell, and a third of me. We just created one new person. The Chimera. Yeah, for I think, free. We just got a new person for free. And that's the thing. It's like thinking it's the same idea of the error budget with Google SRE, right? Which is you, you yep. get rid of something so you can do something else. And, and what's yes. interesting is, you know, if you're listening, raise your hand if you have managed a budget in IT where if you saved money, you were rewarded by having less money the next year. Right? Like that's what happens. You sit there and they're like, you get approval for $10 million this year and then you do an awesome job and you deliver the same or better service spending, you know, 2 million less and they go, great. Now you can do it for, for, for that next year. And your problem is, so what this teaches you because the incentives drive the behavior, they influence the behavior is yes. they influence you to yes. spend money and to not think about it as saving money, right? They're, you're about doing money better. It's about like, oh, well shit, it's the end of the quarter. So what can I go spend money on yes. so that next yes. year when I want to do a thing, I have the okay. money for the thing I don't want to do. So and I love that because when you add value, that's additive every single year. You keep adding value every single year. You can't keep saving money every single year, right? You keep adding value. So there's, there's a follow-up, Su Choi, which is said, you mentioned CI whip limits. In your opinion, what's the biggest contributor to an org success? So that's part of that's going to depend, but I love, so there's an interesting, interesting piece here that that makes me think of. There are most measures in an organization are going to be lagging, which means it's going to tell me what already happened. And that's going to be good for me to know. There are very, very few measures that are going to be leading indicators, which is going to tell me what's about to come. Whip limits, work in process limits, WIP limits is one of the very, very few leading indicators of software performance. I love that. <laughs> which is amazing. Dominica de Grandis will tell you about this. And like, I love it because you talk to her and her face lights up. She gets super excited. So WIP limits, like I would tell so many organizations, if you're not measuring anything, start with WIP limits. And here's why. So WIP limits is like, here's your card of like all the things that you're about to do. Institute WIP limits because so here's why it's, it's a leading indicator of what's about to happen. As, as a software engineer and as a developer, like here's the things I'm working on. Here's the things that are about to come. You keep track in your mind of what you're going to have to do. And you intentionally or not, subconsciously or not, you keep track of, you account for, you accommodate for the work in your backlog. And so you start to build in complexity to be able to deal for the work that's coming. So if you can limit that whip, even if all you do is hide it, I don't want to mean to say like hide it, but, but basically just don't have your, don't let your developer see a 35 card backlog because they will start unintentionally accommodating for the upcoming complexity that doesn't need to be there. I want to ask a follow on to that. And that is, I used to work at a company where we, we, we kind of had whip limits, but uh, people would come to me privately and ask me to do things. And I would kind of hide what I was doing to stay within that whip limit, but uh, it, it didn't end well. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you have any advice for trying to avoid that kind of situation? I do, it's going to sound flippant, just say no. And it's easier said than done. It really is, right? I mean, it. it I'm going to say a thing, and people who know me are going to laugh because I'm currently dying of the whipocalypse. Term stolen, borrowed from Gene Kim, right? So I. It took me a long time to get to the point where I could just say no, but because I'm not very good at it. Because we don't want to say no, because we don't want to look like we aren't being cooperative or we aren't being a team player and I'm currently dying of the apocalypse like really hard right it's not good so like one really good strategy is saying these are the things I need to get done help me prioritize this is all I can do right now 
help me prioritize. You can go to your manager or your team lead, help me prioritize. Right. And that makes sense as I mean, part of a manager's job and a good manager will do this is to shield their team from uh, those kinds of uh, hidden work requests coming in. And, and the challenge is that sometimes we don't make that transparent to our managers. Mm -hmm. And so we need to. That's that's the thing that gets gets challenging, I think. Right. And, and this is I, I have Apocalypse problem. And my wife has been very good about saying you have to remember that you can say no. I'm like, no, you don't understand. But my job is to vote. She goes, no. Right. And if it is, then there's a problem. And this is a very, very hard skill, which is like you just right. said, managing up, right? Yes. And managing up doesn't mean, so the way that we kind of react is either, well, I'll just do it all. And then you're like, the sysadmin who used to work for me, who'd work 80 hour weeks because he just would never say no. He'd say yes to everyone. Didn't matter, whatever. Right. And you can be a great manager and this stuff can happen and you don't even know what's happening or you just let it go because you're still dealing with your own stuff. But what doesn't work is to just then say no to a request, right? You have to follow up. You have to say, what's wrong with the system? You have to run a blameless postmortem on this thing that made you, you were thin provisioned, right? Thin provisioning doesn't work for humans. So what would you do if this was a system? If you had a system that was over capacity, what you wouldn't do is you wouldn't say, well, I let this, you would let the system say no to requests because you don't want it to kill all the, the this analogy is going to going to go south on me in a minute, I think, but it might work. But let's say I have a system and it's capable of supporting 100 requests per second. So now it starts getting more than 100 requests per second. What do I want to have happen? Do I want to let it keep trying to take all those requests and now all the requests suck and suffer, right? Or do I throttle it and say And then you eventually can't they all fall on that. the ground. They all fall on the ground. So nothing gets done. Right. It can't serve any requests or I throttle it and say the system cannot handle more than 100 requests per second. So all requests after that get denied. So this is going to now elevate this to a problem, which and if it's my system, we have to say, well, we have to do this because sucks to be request 101. But what we don't do is just go, well, web server, you know, miss your kids little league game. Right. I mean, like, <laughs> well, so that's the thing. Where people understand that if you give them Nicole's favorite word data, yes. right? And this is where I love the Google SR, SLO model. Like, then there's a period where it's like, I've, I've been humming along at 80 hours a week for a little while. It's fine. It's fine. It'll be fine. So if you're, for people who are not familiar with this, um, service level objective. I've only promised three nines. I've been running at four nines. I've been running at four nines for a while. Guess what? I only promised you three nines. I'm shutting down. Mm -hmm. You're only getting three nines. Why? Because I only promised you three nines. We negotiated three nines. You need to be able to deal with three nines. So, like, you know what? If we have negotiated 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, and I'm running at 80, shut down. Because you need to be able to <laughs> deal and function when I am at 50 hours a week, because like, that's what happens. You need to not be like S3 went down, right? And people like panicked. S3 had been running at way higher than availability. Like that's what happens when you start relying on something yeah. way higher than you should. This is what happens when people burn out. Suddenly they burn out and people are like, I didn't know Chris or Pat or Jesse was, was burning out. Well, we've been relying on them for way too long, and then suddenly they burn out. And relying on again, let's 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 run this SRE book analogy into the ground. But uh -huh. like they have their little side note about their global chubby outage, right? So like they have a service called Chubby that has a relatively low SLO, but it's a pretty robust service. It's it's up almost all the time. And what they were discovering was people were like taking it for granted, for lack of a better yeah. term. So yep. they said we need to just say we just quarterly shut it down. Just to make and, sure and that, that that's we their SLO. Yeah. They 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 if the SLO doesn't happen in the that's the other thing too. We're always about making sure we achieve it, but it's like with your SLO, you have to sort of also say if I over if I go over it, I can bring it down. And if you're a human, so the thing is we also I know a lot because I get a lot of feedback from guests or I'm sorry, listeners to the show who are like, this all sounds rad, but my company's in the dark ages. So a lot of this stuff is really good to say, like, you have to be able to do that. But there's also, what can I do right now when I'm in a slow-moving organization 
that I can't go renegotiate my contract with my boss right now right. and say, I'm going to set this. You can yeah. still do things like you still can say no. We, in a case like that, you don't say no necessarily because you're afraid of not being a team player. You don't say no because you're afraid of getting fired, but you can say, I'm going to say no boss. Here's why. And how are you going to help me? How you can, can ask you for help? prioritization? Help yeah. me prioritize. These are the things that I have. Help me prior. That's I swear. I wish I remember who taught me that phrase. It was. It's the best thing I've ever learned. Help me prioritize. It sounds like a Tom Limoncelli thing from his time management for system administrators. Except I got. Except I know I got it before, and I got it in academia. <laughs> well, it's me. it's probably not an uncommon. Common, I know. Common evolution. Help me. Help me prioritize. And I want to add to that uh, because I have been in the situation. If you're at an organization, you have a boss who says, well, I can't prioritize. We just need to do all of these at the same time yesterday. The best thing to do, and we have this luxury as IT professionals, is to leave. And it's hard because I think a lot of us feel a sense of loyalty to where we're yeah. currently working. And we don't want to leave them in the lurch effectively. But what I tell people is if you were not returning business value to the business, the business would probably not hesitate to let you go. This is an economic transaction, people. Right. And it's, it's the same thing. If the business is not giving business value to you or it's taking substantially away from your life value, it, it's, t it's time to go. Yeah. As you said, it's, it's we're, an economic we're trading, relationship. We're trading money for work. Let's be right. real. Right. I mean, I, I, love, I love everybody. This is lovely. I'm like, I'm running a little startup. I work with Jez and I still all the time have conversations with him. I'm like, I need to make sure that I um, like that you are happy and you are fulfilled doing the work that you're doing. And I am, mo and you are motivated and I'm helping to motivate you and giving you work that's fulfilling and wonderful and lovely because like, this is an economic transaction and I still need to make sure that the thing is right. Cause All right, changing the subject just a little bit, we have another question from Glenn in Hangouts, which is culture question. I'm a yes. software engineer, not a stats person. Do you have any re recommendations on what to read slash learn to help me talk to data science type people better? E.g., my jo last job was at a bank and banks love statistics. How can I leverage their data expertise? Okay. We're talking about stats ops here, I think. Yes, stats ops. So let me think. So it sort of depends on who you're talking to and at what level. I, Matt, go back, to, go back to your thing. Ask about outcomes. Ask about what is important to them and what they're measuring. And then ask about, um, oh, I so want it. This, this is where my metrics workshop comes in super hard. I love this part here because this is where we can start talking about um, translations between um, the business and what's important to the business and then the metrics and, and what we're using here. So ask about um, what they're measuring and why they're measuring it and why it's important. So, and, and start with words and then go to measures. So what outcomes are they measuring and what do they think is driving those outcomes or correlated with those uh, outcomes? And when I say correlated, so. So not everyone knows correlation, although although most uh, many people do. So when I talk about correlation, I just mean how do things move together or move opposite? So when correlation, I mean like when one thing goes up, another thing goes up. If it's exactly correlated, it's a correlation of one. If it's not correlated at all, it means if they don't move at all, it's zero. If it's opposite correlation, it's a negative one. So correlation always kind of ranges between one and negative one. So if it's opposite correlation, one goes up, the other one goes down. This is opposite correlation, this is positive correlation. Um, prediction means that um, as one as one goes up, like historical prediction, then I expect I can predict the movement of something else. Causation means that as one goes up, I know it will cause or it will um, like make something else move. Um, in business, we don't see much causation except when we do things like A/B tests, randomized trials. We tend to see that uh, quite a bit in medical medical contexts. Although as we're doing much more A-B testing online and marketing context, we're seeing more of that. So you can ask them and say, like, what's the, what, are, what types of data are you collecting? And, and why do you think you're collecting it? And just ask them, now, now if you're asking about the data they're collecting, ask them uh, what it stands for. 
you can use the word pro if they use the word proxy, that's what it means, what it stands for. So um, within um, systems engineering or within systems or software, um, we can look at, at lots of different types of things. So a, a good example would be NPS, right, for customer satisfaction. So NPS and customer satisfaction, right? The, the metric is NPS, NPS, customer satisfaction is what it stands for. NPS is net promoter score for those of us Thanks. who don't know. Yes, net promoter score. Um, or if, if we were looking at response time, someone might say, oh, well, for me, that means performance, right? So you can ask them those types of things. If they just start talking about data, you could ask, well, why are we collecting that data? What does that mean to you? Why are we using those? And you can kind of start sketching it out and mapping it out either in your head or actually on paper. And then understanding why, why they're collecting the metrics that they're collecting and then what it means to them. And then if you have a disagreement, try to pull it back to the data and try to understand um, is, the, is your disagreement like if you, if you don't totally understand or agree with what it is they're collecting, do you disagree with the metrics that they're collecting? Or is it that when they're collecting something, if they're collecting NPS, right, net promoter score, is it because you don't think net promoter score is a very good measure? Or is it because you don't think customer satisfaction matters? Hopefully it's not because you don't think customer satisfaction matters. That's, that's a lot of data. And I think we'll try to maybe, uh, Nicole, offline, if you've got some recommendations for some, some light reading about statistics, we'll uh, try to remember to put those in the show notes uh, for Glenn. Um, we got a question from uh, the tweeters uh, from uh, our friend Su Choi, who asked uh, if we could get a recap from you on DevOps Days Austin, which just took place. Uh, one, of, one of the things that happened there, I know, um, was that uh, Nicole was was uh, determined to be the Chuck Norris of DevOps, as, as I have, <laughs> have, have called Bill Dubinsky the Taylor Swift of DevOps. Um, we, we do like our analogies. So it seemed to be amazing. Um, if you could give us your kind of, your highlights, your your lessons learned, or just whatever you want to talk about, about have, sure. being able to be lucky enough to be there. It's been a yeah. long running event. It was amazing. It it was incredible. I don't know how they pulled the speaker lineup that they did, but there were ten keynotes. Um, I'll see if I can remember them off the top of my head. It was Patrick Dubois, um, John Willis, Jez Humble, um, Andrew Clay Schaefer, Damon Edwards, Gene Kim. Myself, Kelsey Hightower, Leo Schlossnagel. How many did I get up to? Who I think they say? cheated and just went to the Wikipedia of DevOps and yep. just like were like these I, are names and I, um, I think they did. It was or they went looked at DevOps against humanity, most popular cards and figured that was. <laughs> do you guys remember DevOps? Sorry, do, do y'all remember DevOps the game? I can't remember. What company did it? It was like a card game about DevOps, and they actually had like power cards for different people, like Jez and Gene, and they were all these cool stylized cartoons. And I don't know if it ever happened, but I think they did. Um, oh, and Adrian Cockcroft. No, huh. oh, I don't know how I forgot him. He was right after me. Um, it was like the community was amazing. The talks were amazing and inspirational. It, everyone needs to go watch Kelsey Hightower's talk. It was, it was amazing. Um, it was really, really, really fantastic and great. All the video is up. He, he gave his talk without slides. He spoke about what it was like um, working in tech and how he got into tech and his personal journey. I don't know that there was a dry eye in the room. And then I had to speak after him. <laughs> It was it was incredible. I'm I'm a better person for knowing Kelsey. That's it was amazing. The other, I mean, all of the all of the speakers were incredible. I'm cannot believe I was fortunate enough to to participate in the event. Um, and and everyone there was lovely. It was such an incredible event. Everyone was great. I it was oh it was amazing. It was great. Um, Everyone had great talks. Um, most of them were brand new talks, so 
they were all really, really fabulous. And the community's great. I mean, I love DevOps days. Awesome. Well, I think so. I found, by the way, the game was called Release. It's called Release oh, the Game, and so I'll put a link in the show notes. I, I, I found the Kickstarter. Game. Yeah, it's it's really funny, like to look at the some of the pictures, and I don't know how I, and if I recall, there was probably some drama about it somehow. Someone didn't like it, you know, because they weren't in it or something, probably. Mm. But um, we should push them on Kickstarter to do a, a new version with everything we've learned. So I think we're getting close to, to wrapping it up. Mm -hmm. uh, Nell, did we have any other questions that you're seeing in our various channels? Uh, nope, I think, I think we've answered all of them. And I think it might be good to move on to picks now. Great. Um, so uh, Nicole, um, we on our show, we call them checkouts because while we also stole them from the Ruby Rogues, we pretended we didn't by changing the name of them. Uh, but either way, I don't know if you have any 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 things you'd like to share with our audience. Uh, books, a beer. I mean, we'd love to share. We'd love to share a beer. Um, anything like that? I know you've got uh, some upcoming uh, conferences you're speaking at or contributing to. Yes, um, speaking at Velocity, speaking at DevOps Enterprise Summit London. We have a metrics workshop coming up uh, June 7th, the day after Does London, and we're repeating the metrics workshop um, July 24th, right before DevOps Days Minneapolis. Also, State of DevOps Report is coming out June 5th, and we have a book coming out that's summarizing everything that we have found the last four years. Rough Cut will be handed out in London. Awesome. Yeah. So if you're listening to this in the future, go find it online somewhere. Yeah, come find all the things. Google is a thing. Yeah. So now what are your picks? Sure. My first is DevOps Day Seattle, which just happened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I was a speaker at it, and the quality of the presentations consistently was great. Oh, it was amazing. See. Yeah, it was very, very well done, very well organized. I know the tickets sold out in three days, which makes you think of like a boy band concert in, in the 90s. Uh, but it, lots of good conversations, lots of good people. I highly recommend going if you can next year. And I think I remember the organizers saying they're looking for a bigger or to allow more people to attend it next year. Uh, the other one is The Expanse, which is a sci-fi drama on Siffy or whatever that channel is called these days. And what I like about that is it has the drama and political intrigue that I loved in Battlestar Galactica. It just happens to take place in a sci-fi world. And there's some bits of horror, but it's not too much. It's similar to Stranger Things, if anyone sees that. And yeah, I don't recommend watching some episodes right before bed, but it's, it's not a gore fest. <laughs> Uh, the, so it's it's tremendously enjoyable. The hashtag for that show confuses me because I don't watch it, but it's like Expanse sci-fi, but it's Siffy, and it looks like Expensify, which is our <laughs> expense system. <laughs> show, but I'm like, why are people tweeting about expense systems? I can understand if it was concur and they want to complain about it, but Expensify is supposed to be good. That is hilarious. Um, so right. yeah. Whatever. Over to you, Matt. Um, so yeah, I've got a couple I just sort of threw together. So one is a silly little game called Robot Unicorn Attack 3. So it's the third iteration. This is done by Adult Swim Games. Um, so Adult Swim, like Cartoon Network. The, it's just an endless runner where you're a robot unicorn and you jump or you crash and die. And it's ridiculous, but the best thing is it's a loop of an erasure song over and over and over again, which makes me just want to play it constantly. So there's like in-app purchase, but you don't need to buy them because the game is dumb, right? Like who cares? Just run and whatever. Um, another app is uh, Nomo Robo. So it's an anti-robocaller app that's been getting a lot of press. Uh, I've been using it lately because despite being on no-call lists, you still get a lot of crap. And I've tried a lot of different alternatives for this. It works pretty well. It has a subscription tied to it, so it's not free, but my annoyance level does have a price so you might want to check that out and then finally this is something i'm predicting to say that i'm telling you should check out so there's this thing called school of rock and i don't mean the uh, you know the the movie with jack black but it's a music school that i think is at least all over the u.s if not potentially international and it's for like you know kids go and learn how to play rock and they learn how to play in a band and my seven-year-old decided a month ago that he wants to learn to play rock music. And he went and he had his first um, 
lesson last week and was obsessed with it. And it seems like, I mean, all the local kids that are in it, they just go, their parents drop them off, they hang out and jam. And it seems like a really great experience. So uh, we'll be reporting back on that more because we know that metal is an integral part of at least doing chef, if not most of DevOps. And when the instructor asked my seven-year-old son who his favorite band was, he replied with Metallica. So I think we're off to a good start. Um, but yeah, so uh, if you go to arrestdevops.com slash call-in show is where all the episodes show notes will be, at least when we release them. So live stream listeners, don't bother yet. You'll 404. Um, that site also is where you can sign up for our newsletter, uh, our Patreon, all that good stuff, all the Arrest DevOps stuff you could ever want. And also foodfightshow.com is where you can find all the internet stuff you would ever want about the Food Fight Show, especially go listen to old episodes if you haven't. Because Food Fight Show was one of the first DevOps podcasts I ever listened to, and I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for Brian Berry and Nathan Harvey, um, who started, you know, and, and Matt Ray, who started the Food Fight Show. So, yay. And I'm so glad that Nell is making it, like, continue to be awesome. I cannot stress that enough. Thank you. I've missed the Food Fight Show. Awesome. Well, uh, this was a fantastic episode. I'm so glad it worked. I was really worried that we weren't going to get any <laughs> questions. So thank you so much to everyone who asked, submitted a question, everyone who listened. And thanks so much to Nicole for joining us. Yes, thanks for having me. And with that, I'm Nell on Twitter at at Nell I'm Matt at Matt Stratton. We're Food Fight Show and Arrested DevOps. And remember, there's always DevOps in the banana stand. So keep it hot. All right. <laughs> <laughs>